Welcome back to our program, Hollywood Structured. As some of you already know, our program is designed to help the young people who wish to enter the entertainment field, maybe music, nightclub work, theater, television, or film. It is also designed to help the parents and the educators of those young people, to help them understand their wants, their needs, and the pitfalls and the traps they may fall into unless thoroughly acquainted with the inner workings of Hollywood. Today, as our special guest, we have someone who, at the ripe age of 10 months, started to sing. At the ripe old age of six, he was doing vaudeville. And ever since, I don't think there is one job in the entertainment field that he hasn't done. He's a singer, a composer, a musical arranger, a producer, an actor, an author, an orchestra leader, somebody that I've had the pleasure to work with on a movie called Walk Like a Dragon, someone who has entertained three presidents at the White House, and someone who was described by Bing Crosby as the best singing entertainer he had ever seen. His name is Mel Tomei. Hello, Mel. Hello, Lily. How are you? Who are all those people you just mentioned? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, My, you, you. Nobody you. can do all that stuff. <laughs> um, usually, uh, Mel, I teach here for two and a half minutes or three minutes. Mm. But today, after reading and rereading your bio, there is so much to talk about that I've decided that maybe the best thing for me to do is to teach through your experiences and your expertise. Mm. So, tell me about 10 months you sang at 10 months of age? That's what my mother says, Lily. I mean, I obviously don't remember it, but she says that I sang a full song at the age of 10 months. Now, you must understand that I believe that singing and performing in general, acting, if you will, uh, is partly genetic, it's partly environmental, it's partly, I suppose, God-given, that strange mystical mystique that happens to some people who evince and display talent. Uh, but my now, were, mother, your, were your parents in the entertainment field? No, but my dad was an amateur dancer, and my family, and that's what I wanted to tell you, my family sang, sang, so they always were singing. My whole family, not just my mother and father, but my father's brothers, uh, we were a very, very musical family. We're Jewish, and they brought all the songs back from uh, Russia, where, where both of my parents, uh, my dad actually was born in Russia, my mother's family came from Russia. So the whole family, male and female, father and mother, are basically Russian Jews. And uh, they had this wealth of music that I began hearing and ingesting by some strange process of osmosis when I was very, very young. I guess it's not too surprising that I sang a song at 10 months. Now, um, please address the camera directly. You don't have to look at me. Okay. The, um, there are some young people who are out there mm -hmm. who think, oh, I am first generation American. I don't stand a chance. You were first generation American, were mm -hmm. you not? Yes, I was. That didn't impair you at all. No, not at all. And I think that we have a better chance as first generation Americans. The, I, I'm going to save some comments, if I may, for the last couple of minutes of the show uh, without being pontifical about it, without, you know, uh, I hope not pompous, but I would like to address the young people uh, who are interested in making a career out of show business, whether it be acting or directing or writing or music or uh, singing, playing an instrument, because uh, I, I may have a little something Im important to impart. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, you're now four years old, and you're being taken to a restaurant. And what happens from there? Well, I was an inveterate radio listener when I was a child, and uh, I lived in Chicago. I was born in Chicago. And uh, one night, my mother and father took me to see the orchestra that I loved listening to, on the radio so much. The orchestra was a, a band called the Kuhn Sanders Orchestra. Carlton Kuhn was the drummer and Joe Sanders was the pianist and they jointly led this band. And so I went down to the Black Hawk restaurant, which is a famous restaurant in uh, Chicago and downtown in the Loop, and we had dinner and they perceived that I was singing all their songs with them. I was sitting ringside. And finally, uh, Joe Sanders walked over to my table and said, who is this little squirt or something? <laughs> 
And my mother said, oh, he knows all your songs. And they got me up to sing. Uh, it was the end of the 1920s. It was a very weird time in this country. The Roaring Twenties and uh, novelties were the, the order of the day. So I got up and I sang. And that uh, proceeded to become a Monday night feature at the Black Hawk restaurant every Monday night for about six months with the Coon Sanders Band. I think they paid me $15 a night and food for the family. In other words, dinner for the family. That was a lot of money it in was. 1930. You my bet God. it was. You bet it was. And that literally began my professional career. Now, at six you were working in vaudeville, right? That's right. Now, did you have time to go to school? Oh, what? absolutely. And I went to a regular public school. Uh, went to kindergarten and, of course, right through elementary school into a public high school. It wasn't easy to juggle what was then literally a career, because I did vaudeville uh, when I was six. I broke into dramatic radio when I was eight years old and became, they tell me, one of the busiest child actors on radio, uh, not only in Chicago, but in radio in general, uh, from about 1934 to about 1930. 40 or 41, when my voice changed and I, I wanted to move into other things anyway, you know. So I was literally pursuing a career professionally at the time, doing vaudeville on the weekends, doing radio during the weekdays, having, be, having to be let out of school many times early to the chagrin of my schoolmates. I got beat up several times because they resented, really? oh absolutely, but uh, it was all part of the growing process. Were there gangs at that no, time? No, no, no gangs, no, no, no gangs. gangs. Now, no. were you a good student in school? I was middling. I was, I was a pretty good student. I didn't get, you know, straight A's or anything like that. But I was a voracious reader. I loved to read. And very early on, uh, I began reading everything I could lay my hands on. No kidding, from the Sunday funnies to comic books to Dickens. Uh, to thriller writers like Agatha Christie. I just read the, the broadest spectrum of kinds of things to read imaginable. Now, did you have a chance to go to college, or were you working too, too much at that time? Never went to college, Lily. Never went to I, college. I, I was, by that time, by the time I got out of high school, I was immersed in playing instruments. I, I'm basically a drummer, but I, I taught myself to play piano, taught myself to arrange. I was singing uh, constantly, and consequently, uh, there just wasn't time to go to college. Now, how did you learn drumming? Did you do it on your own? I, I started playing drums in grammar school when I was about eight years old in the Drum and Bugle Corps. Oh, and so you took it in school? I took it in of. school, but I didn't study it. I just, uh, they gave me a drum and I, I looked at other people and copied them and began to play. And uh, it really became my principal instrument. Now, I am going to mention just a few names. Okay. Tell me what they bring to you. Harry James. Harry James almost took me with his band when I was uh, 15 years old or 16 years old. It never worked out, but I, he was always a great hero of mine musically. And he recorded a song I wrote when I was 15 years old, a song called Lament to Love. And it got on, you call it the top 40, the young people call it the top 40 now. We call it the hit parade. And it got on the hit parade and was number seven on the hit parade out of 10 for mm, about six weeks. I was, at that time, I was the youngest. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's any distinction in this particularly, but I was the youngest songwriter ever to have gotten a song on the hit parade. And there was a big hullabaloo about it, you know. Nowadays, that's not very, very uh, unusual. All right. Les Brown. Les Brown was a man who, of course, with his great band, who was a friend of mine for a long time out here, and he was the one who recommended that I break up my vocal group that I had put together, the Meltones, and go out on my own. He and a great band leader named Woody Herman jointly uh, persuaded me to leave my vocal group and indeed uh, go forward as a solo singer. This was at the end of 1946. So I owe Les Brown an awful lot. Chico Marx. <laughs> Chico Marx was one of the three Marx Brothers, and if you've seen the Marx Brothers pictures on, on television or even in the movies, you know that uh, he was the one who played piano with the Italian accent, and he would run his fingers up the keys and shoot individual keys. Very distinctive and, and novelty and interesting way to play piano. Put a band together during the war, 1943, 
And I actually, I joined them in 1942 and was with the band for approximately a year and learned a lot being on the road, playing drums, writing vocal group arrangements and being one of the three singers in the band. Would you say that you learn your job, a lot of it on the road? I mean, you learn on the job? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It is on the job training. And uh, I must say that uh, that is, for me, at least for me, not mm -hmm. for everybody, but for me it was the best college musically that I could go to. Just listening, absorbing, asking a lot of questions, learning. That's the way I learned to become an, uh, an orchestrator, an arranger by literally asking the, the wonderful people who were writing arrangements for me how to apply the arranging method to somebody who's as dumb as me, who's never studied. And through a long process of hit and miss, trial and error, I became an arranger. I want to go back to arranging, but I want to ask one more name, mm -hmm. Artie Shaw. Uh, well, Artie Shaw, again, uh, was a man, he was the man who gave me the opportunity to sing some solos on some great records that he made. I still had the vocal group. And those solos that I sang with Artie Shaw that came out on record are the solos that precipitated Les Brown and Woody Herman to say, listen to this. This, this guy might make it as a solo singer. So I owe Artie Shaw even more. He's a great friend of mine and certainly far and away my favorite clarinetist of all time. But beyond that, Artie Shaw was the single true intellectual in all of the band business. There were a lot of bright men in the band business, don't get me wrong, and some very astute and even literate band leaders. But Artie Shaw transcends that. He's an absolute intellectual. And to be with him is, and just listen to him is to learn a great deal by just shutting your mouth and listening. Now, you're on the road. Suddenly, you're in Hollywood. What, what brings you here? I was with the Chico Marx band, and uh, they were casting a movie at, uh, at RKO Pictures called Higher and Higher. It was to be Frank Sinatra's first movie, and it also had Victor Borga in it and Jack Haley and uh, some wonderful people. And there was a part for a young boy in it, a young guy. And uh, a, a talent scout saw me with the Chico Marx band at the Roxy Theater in New York, where I was appearing with them. And he took me onto the roof of that theater with a silent 16 millimeter camera and said, just turn to the right, now turn to the left, now let me see you straight <laughs> forward. Now say a few things. We don't have any sound, but just we want to see how your mouth works. you know. And so I did, and I got the part. And that's why I came to Hollywood. So were you put on the contract, or were you just working movie after movie? I was working movie after movie. I wasn't under contract to RKO. Uh, I had, they had an option. I mean, they didn't pick it up. Although, I got very nice reviews in that film. But um, I then went over to Universal and played opposite a wonderful gal named Gloria Jean in a movie. Then I went over to Columbia. This is all within the space of about 18 months. Then I went over to 20th Century Fox and was finally signed in 1947 to um, a, a long-term contract with MGM Pictures. Now, tell me about Perry Como. Hmm. Well, Perry Como, see, to me, is the epitome of what I like to see in a singer. He's very laid back. He's very calm, very cool. His singing reflects that. I have to be fair, and I don't think Perry would be mad at me if I said this. I don't think that Perry, and I don't think Perry thinks that Perry is the most, quote, exciting singer that I've ever seen. But he sings so beautifully in tune. He has such gorgeous tonal quality. Uh, and he's, he's wonderfully pleasant to listen to. Did you not at one time take over his show and became a TV host? Yes. Uh, in 1951, the summer of 51, Perry Como was doing a 15-minute show, I think five times a week or maybe three times a week, uh, on CBS. And uh, for the summer, Peggy Lee and I took over his show while he had a, took a hiatus, took a vacation. And we did a show called TV's Top Tunes. That led to my being put under contract to CBS. And I did my own talk show, half hour every day, for about two years on CBS from New York. George Schlater. <laughs> well, you're, you're throwing some interesting names at me. George Schlater uh, 
was a used to be a publicity man and became a producer and produced the rather ill-fated Judy Garland show of 1963 and into 64 on CBS. And George Slaughter called me in Florida, where I was appearing, and asked me to come back to Hollywood and to settle down into a, an office and to write all of Judy Garland's special musical material, original songs and help her put medleys together, and really kind of be a musical advisor to her. Uh, I was in the middle of a very difficult marriage at the time, and I felt that some of the traveling might have been part of the trouble with the mm -hmm. marriage. So it was a chance to try to save what was unfortunately already a doomed marriage. Mm -hmm. So I came back and I started working on the Judy Garland show. And rather ironically, George Slaughter did five shows and was fired. And I stayed on for 23. Now that brought about another career for you. You became an author. Yes. Mm -hmm. I wrote a book about my experiences on the, uh, the Judy Garland show. It wasn't a, um, it wasn't a full-blown biography of Judy at all. It was purely and simply my experiences writing the Judy Garland television show on CBS and what I perceived about Judy and many of the guests and the, the people who were part of the crew and uh, it did extremely well. Uh, it came out in three separate hardcover printings uh, Bantam printed it, uh, Bantam Books, they printed five printings of it. And uh, now, interestingly enough, uh, my fifth book is a book about Buddy Rich, the great drummer, who was also a great friend, and Oxford University Press, who are publishing the Buddy Rich book, are bringing out the Judy Garland book again. Oh, really? Yeah, it's about the seventh different publisher to bring it out, and it'll come out in conjunction with the Buddy Rich book. Tell me about this book. Well, that was Mel Tome, it was an old velvet. <laughs> <laughs> well, in a sense, and we're talking to young people now who are interested in getting into show business or into the entertainment world, uh, the title reflects the fact that somebody once named me the Velvet Fog. I mean, it's a silly little nickname. So I kind of correlated it into this title. But the most important part of the title is that uh, show business isn't velvet at all. It's an extremely difficult business to be in. Uh, there are the vicissitudes, the disappointments, the rejections in show business as you go through life in show business uh, are sometimes more than people can stand. You have to have an extremely strong constitution to put up with it. Now, I realize that in recent years, Lily, that uh, uh, young people have come along, learned to play three chords on a guitar, let their hair grow long, wear absurd clothes and become eighty thousand dollar a night performers and those are those people are the exceptions they're really not the rule i'm a great believer in being prepared and been paying your dues and serving an apprenticeship that's the way i came up and uh, i think that that kind of foundation is terribly important uh, in, in a kind of get-rich-quick scheme of things that we, we live in today. Um, if a young person had asked you to describe Hollywood in a very short term, <laughs> what would you say? That's very difficult because Hollywood is, if, if you said to me, describe Hollywood, I would say one word, chameleon. Because Hollywood has changed, 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 back, sideways, forward, uh, it, it's taken on so many different views. For instance, to give you an idea, when I came to Hollywood in 1942, Hollywood Boulevard was as charming a main street as any town you could possibly go to. I just, I couldn't resist going on Hollywood Boulevard. I'm a great movie fan and, and going to the great theaters, the Egyptian and the Grauman's Chinese, which is now man's Chinese, uh, uh, and, and, and going to the nightclubs around the Hollywood Boulevard areas, jazz clubs that played wonderful performers. Uh, well, you know what Hollywood Boulevard is now. I mean, I, I am loath to walk on Hollywood Boulevard now. I mean, it's just totally changed. And it's, I think, kind of dangerous, particularly at night. That's what's happened to the world. This town, when I came here, Lily, uh, one of the charms of the town was that I was from Chicago, and you know the buildings in Chicago are brown and, and maroon brick, you know. Mm -hmm. I came here for the first time on the El Capitan train, 
and I got off the train and was absolutely mesmerized by the fact that A, everything looked so clean and white. Most of the buildings were painted white, and many of them still are. And the fact that there were no high-rise buildings. There were no condos. There were almost no hotels, and the, ho the hotels there were were two and three stories. A famous Hollywood hotel was still on the corner, the northwest corner of Highland and Hollywood. And it was charming. The whole town was charming. I think what's gone from this town now are two elements, romance and charm. And you see that element, in my opinion, gone from the movies now. There's very little charm in movies. But then again, we don't have the Cary Grants and the Clark Gables and the Ty Powers and the people that we all loved in those days who were literally a breed apart. They were literally a breed apart. Now, of course, the movies, uh, and incidentally, music as well. Uh, I, I feel that the audience needs to relate. Whereas in those days, the days of which mm -hmm. I speak, the, the, the Cary Grants and the Gary Coopers and people like that, and Clark Gables and Lana Turner's and, of course, Greer Garson's, you can go right down the list, were demigods of some sort. And I kind of like that. Is it possible that we have upcoming good young actors who could become the star of tomorrow if they had different material to perform in? Oh, I think so. I mean, I think that the, the age of permissiveness is such that we're hearing vile things come out of wonderful actors' mouths. Uh, Four-letter words, I mean, are just, uh, they've lost their meaning. Because every time you go to the movies, even young people, I mean, when I say young, I mean kids, little kids, eight, nine, ten years old, and I, I, I've never been called a square, but I mean, I sit there and think, is this really necessary to have this kind of garbage coming out of young people's mouth? It seems to be the thing. There are some wonderful actresses around. Mm -hmm. Jodie Foster, I think, is the finest actress working right now. I just think she's magnificent. There's a new girl, Annette Benning, mm -hmm. who is showing enormous promise. I mm -hmm. think she's terrific. And obviously Meryl Streep, who's, you know, yeah. tremendous. There's some great people. Uh, and there's some, obviously, uh, Gene Hackman and uh, Bobby De Niro. I mean, there's mm -hmm. some superb people. But they are in, them, in and of themselves. They're not of the stripe. I don't mean as good or bad. I don't oh, mean I that at all. But they're of a different stripe than the, the great Hollywood stars of the 30s and the 40s. Maybe that's progress. I don't know. <laughs> um... You never had a chance to choose any other kind of career than the entertainment field. Did you ever think of something you might have wanted to do besides entertaining? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and if you ever read my book, you'll find out. Uh, <laughs> in 1960, when the rock and roll incursion was so huge, yes. uh, and a lot of great songwriters that I knew were terribly depressed and discouraged and weren't writing anymore, and I felt that the kind of music that I loved and grew up with and was weaned on and encouraged by and nourished by was really relegated to a big back seat in favor of rock. Mm -hmm. I called several ground aviation schools and thought that I might totally change careers and become an airline pilot. Really? Uh, yes, absolutely. Do you fly? Yes, I do. Oh, you do? Uh, I'm a private pilot. Yes. Although I wasn't at that time. But I've always loved airplanes, and maybe it's my vicarious enjoyment of airplane movies. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I really very seriously pursued it. And wiser heads than mine said two things. You're really, at 30 years old, you're, you're, you're 35, actually, at that time. You're, you're too old to begin an airline career. And B, uh, this is a pendulum. It swings. Right now, it's far to the right, and rock is, you know. But it will swing back, and were they? ever right. right. 1990, Lily, we've known each other a long time, yes. we did a movie together, uh, astonishingly was the biggest single career year I have ever had in my entire life, and 91 is going to top it. So I'm, I'm, I can't tell you how grateful I am that I listened to much wiser heads than mine who said, take it easy, you know, lay back a little bit, mark your time, you know, mark time, it'll all come back, and it did. 
I have another career for you. I don't know that you have ever done it. Have you ever scored a movie? No, I've been asked to score a couple of movies, but see, scoring for me, I write all my own orchestrations uh -huh. right up to the symphony, but I'm very, very slow. And consequently, to try to score a movie, I, I don't think I would have the patience to sit down and score an hour and a half you know, film or a two-hour movie. So at this point, the few people that have contacted me and said, how'd you like to write a score for this? I have really backed away from it. Uh, you won't believe this. We're getting close. You have now your two minutes or one minute and a half to speak directly to the young people or to the parents if you want to. Well, I'd speak to both of them. I mean, uh, an awful lot of parents will look at their children and say, oh, you want to be in show business. Uh, I recommend that you let a child who is showing any kind of talent have his or her head l go after it and see. Just try to be the best there is. Uh, I think I mentioned just a few moments ago that the wisest course, in my opinion, if you're going to, for instance, be a singer, is to study. Even if you decide that you still want to revert back to rock and sing that kind of music, it's better to have a foundation than to merely go into it and bat your head against an almost insurmountable wall, a wall, a legion of young people like yourself who are going to go and try to become rock stars. There are literally only so many niches, but if you have a background and the rock thing doesn't work and you study trumpet and say, well, look, I could play with a symphony orchestra, I could play with a jazz band, I could do many, many things, and I think that's terribly important. I think secondarily, and I know you've heard this a million times, and I'm boring myself and you as I say it, but listen, trust me, honest to God, a good education serves you so well, Not maybe not now, maybe you're saying, oh, I don't need that, I'm, I, I know three chords on a guitar, or I got this set of drums, but trust me when I tell you that in later life, you will do this. Why didn't I learn to read properly? Why didn't I gather for myself a really good, voluminous vocabulary? Because the people I respect the most are people who don't say, hey, I could care less, because I could care less is incorrect. And people say it right, left, and center. If you say, I could care less, you mean, I care, but I could care less, not I couldn't care less. That's just a little example. But you <laughs> learn that if you go ahead and get educated properly. Mel, I have to wrap up. I would like to thank Mel for his experiences and his expertise. Thank you. Pleasure. And remember, young people out there, please keep watching us because we keep watching out for you. Thank you. Be well. Till next time.